Well, I often uh, begin my presentations on the climate crisis with the pictures of uh, the, the Earth, uh, but the context that David has set for us is so much uh, larger and more extensive. But uh, let me begin by, by saying I'm going to talk about uh, two questions. First, do we have to change our current course? And second, if we do, can we? And the danger that I'll describe in the first part is matched by the fantastic opportunity that I'll describe in the second part of my presentation, and I'm very excited about that. But let me begin uh, by picking up on one theme that David talked about, and that is the need to manage large flows of energy in order to avoid the dangers that come with fragility. This is the element of the Earth system that is the most vulnerable and produces fragility. We have the impression viscerally that the sky is a vast and limitless expanse. But as this uh, picture from space shows, the atmosphere when seen edge on is a very thin layer around the Earth. And we are now putting into that thin layer of atmosphere 110 million tons of global warming pollution, principally CO2, every 24 hours. Uh, and it comes from this civilization that has sprung up, uh, fueled 85% by fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels is not the only cause. Don't worry about covering all of these uh, topics, uh, but I want to set the context with a reference to the fact that agriculture matters a lot. Forests matter a lot. The possibility that the melting of the permafrost that's beginning to release large flows of methane could increase, that could be a tipping point. But the principal source of the problem is, and this recalls one of the images that David uh, showed, the burning of fossil fuels, which has put enormous amounts of global warming pollution uh, into the atmosphere. And as the CO2 levels increase, temperature increases. The outgoing infrared radiation is trapped over a 2,000 year period here. The cumulative amount of man-made global warming pollution now in the atmosphere traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic weapons going off every day. It's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy, especially when you multiply it by 400,000 every single day. So this is the only complicated slide I'm gonna show, so permit me to spend just a moment explaining it. This shows average temperatures on the Earth, uh, and a team of scientists led by Jim Hansen studied temperatures all over the Earth for the last 65 years. The white are normal temperatures, defined uh, as what they were in the 30-year period from 1951 to 1980. The blue are cooler than average temperatures, the, the red are warmer than average. So in the 1980s, the entire pattern shifted to the right. We see the emergence in the lower right of extremely uh, hot days. In the 1990s, the extremely hot days grew. The warmer than normal days come to dominate. And in the last decade, the extremely hot days have become more numerous than cooler than average days. In fact, they are now 100 times more common than they were just a few decades ago. And they're driving extreme weather events. They're increasing temperatures all over the Earth. Last year uh, was the 38th year in a row that was warmer uh, than the 20th uh, century. Last month was the 358th month in a row that was above the 20th century average. Uh, this past decade has been by far the hottest decade ever measured with instruments. The 14 of the 15 hottest years ever measured have been in the first 14 years of this century. And as three separate scientific teams just announced last week, the hottest year of all ever measured was last year. So this extreme heat causes problems for people, for animals, for plants, and for ecosystems. This woman's uh, cooking pork and shrimp on the back of a car uh, in China. Uh, 
but on a global basis, 90% of all this extra heat is uh, trapped in the oceans. Uh, and new measurements of ocean temperature with new instruments give us a much more precise picture of what's happening in the oceans, and it has consequences. One year ago, Super Typhoon Haiyan formed in the Pacific and crossed areas of the Pacific to the windward of the Philippines that were three and a half degrees Celsius warmer than normal. So it became the most powerful and most destructive storm ever to make landfall, creating well, thousands of deaths, but more than four million homeless refugees. Pope Francis uh, was just in uh, the Philippines and talked about the climate crisis. He will have an encyclical uh, at the beginning of this summer that is greatly uh, anticipated. He has spoken about it uh, quite frequently. Two years ago in the North Atlantic, uh, the warmer temperatures just to the windward of New York and New Jersey were five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than normal. So Superstorm Sandy became a monster uh, storm, causing devastation on the coastal uh, on the co uh, coast of New Jersey and elsewhere and inundating uh, parts of Manhattan. The 9-11 World Trade Center Memorial Site uh, was flooded uh, while it was nearing the end of its construction. The Hudson River in downtown Manhattan was literally pouring into the ground zero site. So as the temperatures of the oceans increase, uh, this not only makes the ocean-based storms stronger, it has several other consequences as well. One of them is that evaporation off the oceans into the atmosphere increases dramatically. This is not water, it's water vapor. Average humidity has increased 4% just in the last 40 years, 50%, 5% uh, in the last century. The warmer air holds more water. And when storm conditions cause downpours, this water vapor is funneled sometimes 2,000 kilometers to the place where it's released. That's why we're getting these historic downpours that are unprecedented uh, and far more frequent. Uh, this is uh, why we have the floods that result and the mudslides and landslides. Uh, in the U.S. last uh, year, uh, there was 61 centimeters of rain that fell in 26 hours in Florida. Really, a, not a hurricane, just a monster storm. One day later, this same storm moved up the east coast of North America to Baltimore, and a passerby took out a cell phone and watched this happen. The infrastructure we built was designed for a world that we are now changing in fairly radical ways as a consequence of global warming. In Montpellier, 25 centimeters in three hours a few months ago. In Genoa, this was the second of three historic events uh, that affected uh, uh, Genoa this fall, this past uh, fall. Uh, enormous economic damage. In Malaysia, just uh, three weeks ago, uh, more than a quarter million people displaced from their homes. Uh, in Greece, they've had, no, in uh, India, I'm sorry, uh, this was in 2013, tr uh, tremendous uh, damage. Uh, and of course, in Pakistan, this is worth remembering just four years ago because 20 million people were forced from their homes, further destabilizing uh, a nuclear armed country. The mudslides uh, just in the last uh, few months in Sri Lanka, uh, in Indonesia, uh, in uh, Afghanistan last year, uh, almost as many people were killed in mudslides as all of the people killed in the war the previous year. Uh, in Central America, 1.5 meters of rain in 10 days. Five feet of rain uh, in 10 days. Uh, Mexico has been hit numerous times. England had the worst flooding in its entire history last year. Germany uh, and five other nations in uh, Central and Eastern Europe had what was called a 500-year flood. Those statistics no longer are accurate. Uh, in Hiroshima Prefecture just a few months ago, in Chongqing, uh, China, uh, another uh, deadly uh, mudslide. Uh, in China last uh, summer, more than three million people forced from their homes. Uh, this was uh, 
two years ago in Sichuan, six million people driven from their homes. Another cell phone camera, I won't play the entire video, many buildings uh, were, uh, were destroyed. This was in Malawi just three days ago, and this morning there are 200,000 people homeless in Malawi because of this storm, uh, just to this flood, just in the last few days. Now, next, the same heat that evaporates this water vapor uh, into the sky, causing the floods and mudslides, also pulls more of the soil moisture out of the land, creating these historic droughts. This uh, is in Sao Paulo uh, State, uh, where the Climate Reality Project just had a training. There were over 150, 140 uh, cities in Brazil rationing water last year. Many of them are still rationing uh, water. This is uh, in China, historic drought in Henan uh, province, a big agricultural powerhouse and several surrounding provinces. This is the largest freshwater lake in China just a few years ago. Here it is last week, uh, still dry. This was one of the most prolific uh, fishing uh, sites in China. Uh, 20 provinces in Indonesia affected by drought uh, this fall. Both Koreas, the worst droughts uh, in their entire uh, history. This fall, Nicaragua, extreme hunger in several of these countries. 80% of Guatemala's corn crop was destroyed. In my country, the biggest agricultural state, California, is still 98% in drought. And where there are high temperatures and drought, there are fires. Uh, the correlation uh, is exact. The water reservoirs uh, are now uh, dangerously depleted. In the western part of North America, the fires have been particularly intense. And in Australia, this was uh, just two weeks ago uh, near Adelaide. Uh, this was in Valparaiso last year, the largest fire in the history uh, of Valparaiso. The city was uh, utterly devastated. When the soils dry out, the vegetation does, and any spark can cause uh, much larger consequences. The most serious, perhaps, was a few years ago in Russia. 55,000 people were killed, mostly by smoke inhalation, but the consequences were also global because four months later, Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan took all of their grain off of world markets, causing the all-time record in food prices. For the, for, for the third time, a second time uh, in three years, triggering food riots in 60 countries, and the second time, more than 30 countries. Uh, from uh, South Asia to South America, uh, this is in India, and in North Africa. It was a food vendor in Tunisia who set himself on fire, touching off the, uh, the Arab Spring, and there were many causes, of course, but it happened at a time of historically high food prices and the stress related. One of many reasons why the U.S. Defense Department uh, just this fall made the point, as others have, that global, the global climate crisis is intensifying the risks of conflict and hunger and poverty uh, and instability. There are many causes for the gates of hell opening in Syria, but this man illustrates one reason. From 2006 to 2010, there was a climate-related re historic drought that destroyed 60% of the farms in Syria, 80% of the livestock, and drove a million refugees into the cities where they collided with another million refugees from the Iraq war. They warned internally the Syrian government, we can't handle this. So the consequences uh, can be quite severe. The costs of carbon are mounting up in all of these ways. We are paying it every single day. I haven't even talked about most of them. I'll refer briefly uh, to sea level rise from the melting of Greenland and Antarctica. These are the 10 cities most at risk from population, measured by population. These are the 10 most at risk, measured by assets at risk. Look at Miami. It's already happening. There was no rainfall for a long time before this video was taken. This is a high tide. The seawater is now coming up of, through the, the storm drains. Uh, and people are sloshing through it, saying, I don't think there's any global warming. What do you think? Kind of hard to miss it. The insurance companies haven't missed it. This is having consequences around the world, perhaps most seriously for those who live in the low-lying areas of the world, including 
uh, the island nations who have been very eloquent. Kiribati added a new line item to its budget a few years ago, fund to purchase a new country. They're all moving. And some civilizations in the past have made the wrong environmental choices and have disappeared. The, we now have a global civilization and we have to make choices. Luckily, we have the solutions at hand. And this is why I'm so excited about all of the work that is being done led by the business community. Look at the predictions just 14 years ago about renewable energy. Wind power would reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. Well, we beat that by 10 times over. Why? Well, because business and innovators have brought down the cost of wind, and now we're seeing uh, project managers and developers installing wind at a, an, a growing exponential rate, creating millions of jobs all around the world. With solar energy, the story is even more dramatic. The prediction was one gigawatt per year by 2010. We beat that goal by 17 times over. Last year, we beat that goal by 48 times over. This year, we're on track to beat it by 62 times over. This is happening. We can do this. We need to accelerate the change, but we have the ability to solve this crisis. Again, the cost of crystalline silicon is coming down. All forms of solar electricity production. Look at this exponential curve. It's like what happened with mobile phones? They predicted a few. There are now 6.5 billion mobile phones in the world. Nobody expected that to happen. We're crossing a threshold. This is another of many reports showing that grid parity, which is the point where solar electricity is cheaper than electricity from other sources, it's being reached in country after country, state after state. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a tipping point. And not unlike the difference between zero degrees and one degree, or 32 and 33 in Fahrenheit, it's not just a difference of a degree. This is the difference between ice and water. And in markets, it's the difference between markets that are frozen up and markets that are liquid. The investment flows are increasing. And we're now seeing the deployment of solar electricity on the roofs of grass huts. Uh, in Africa. Bangladesh is the fastest deploying country in the world. On average, 24 hours a day, two new rooftop PV systems per minute. India has just announced a, a fantastic, uh, dramatic new plan. One of the poorest countries in the world. They want their, to power cell phones, they want to power computers, they want to connect to the world. And energy is the key. A developed country, uh, Australia, one in seven homes have PV rooftop systems. In the state of Victoria, it's closing in on one out of every two homes. This is uh, uh, in uh, Chile, President Bachelet in one year has brought the, uh, the solar market all the way up. Uh, and it is still growing extremely rapidly. Germany, a northern latitude country with lots of clouds, 35% of its energy from renewables. One day last year, 74% from wind. And the Vatican, wait a minute, let me go back one. They want to be the first country to be carbon neutral. They have two advantages. They're very small, and God is on their side. Enough solar energy reaches the Earth in one hour to power the entire world for a full year. When we in increase the fraction that we harvest, we're in. Citibank just announced the age of renewables is beginning. Berkshire Hathaway just doubled down on a $15 billion investment in wind and solar. Look at the green bond market, a 15-fold increase over the last two years. This is exploding, and the private sector is leading the way. Almost two-thirds of the financing is coming from the private sector. The investment in new energy generation crossed over to renewables in 2009. Uh, in 13, it, the margin grew. This is an estimated for the fossil, but this is the new number for renewables last year. This is the source of energy uh, in the future, and it's extremely uh, exciting. Now, the carbon energy, uh, is we're going to have to change. This is all the carbon energy that's been burned. This is the amount burned since 2000. These are all the proven reserves left. The scientists tell us we can only burn this much and still have a safe future. So uh, we have to hear the head of the central bank in England and others who say the vast majority of these reserves 
are unburnable, subprime carbon assets, subprime for other ways. We know what's been happening in China with the air pollution, the air apocalypse. The life expectancy has gone down five and a half years in northern China. Uh, the, Chinese, the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences says it's nearing the point where it's no longer livable. So we need to put a price on carbon to speed up this, uh, this uh, transition. And we need to put a price on denial in politics. People need to stop financing uh, denial. Now, luckily, this is moving in the policy area. Emissions trading or carbon taxes in all of these countries, uh, in process in these countries. In the US, we will this year begin limiting carbon emissions. So this is extremely exciting. And in November of this past year, uh, President uh, Barack Obama and President Xi Jinping signed an historic agreement, the first cap, an agreement to reduce uh, in China. This is uh, resonating all around the world. And this, at the end of this year in Paris, we are seeing another UN meeting. The day before the summit in New York last year, 400,000 people marched in the streets for an agreement. Tens of thousands in other cities around the world. So this is the year of climate. The Paris negotiation is crucial. In order to ensure its success, we need the political will. But political will is a renewable resource. And as part of the effort to renew that global political will, I am very excited, grateful uh, to Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum that we, that my colleagues and I in just a moment are able to announce uh, here on this stage in Davos a major event this year. I want to invite uh, the legendary uh, artist, beloved uh, uh, creative uh, artist, Pharrell Williams, who is the creative director of Live Earth, to join me on stage with Kevin Wall, the co-founder of Live Earth, and the one who makes it all happen. Please uh, come on up. We are going to have one event uh, all over the world on all seven continents. We said uh, six, but we've since organized a band in Antarctica. Uh, there will be an audience of two billion, the largest television, digital, radio network ever created, uh, all as one. And the creative director is a man I'm proud to call a friend who I admire greatly, Pharrell Williams. Tell us about it. Um, first of all, thank you for having us all here. Um, in 2007, I was lucky enough to be named the creative director of the Live, uh, Live Earth event, uh, in which case um, that we convened in um, Rio, in Ipanema, on the beach of uh, Ipanema, and it was Lenny Kravitz and myself, and it was over a million people on the beach, and we had a ball. And um, it was a fairly new subject for me, but it was a very interesting challenge, and I noticed that here and there people would, you know, you would have pundits and you would have uh, comedians who didn't understand global warming, and so we were often ridiculed. But um, after seeing such an incredible presentation and watching the news, I think you guys know how serious the global warming thing is. And so for us, we're taking it very seriously, and we wanted to do something very different this time. Um, instead of just having people perform, we literally, and I can't go all the way into it now because uh, some interesting surprises coming out soon, but we literally are going to have humanity harmonize all at once. And I am very, very, very happy and proud to be a part of this, um, this moment for our species. We're a very precious species, and if we've learned anything from what David's shown us earlier, is that 
it takes the perfect conditions. And I, I think that we have to continue to give to that idea of it being a perfect condition in this world. So thank you guys very much. Well, th thank you, Pharrell. And the, the purpose is to have a billion voices with one message to demand climate action now. Kevin Wall, my co-founder and partner, uh, is the head of Control Room and the Climate Reality Project is joining with this. Kevin, tell us more details. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, when you, the power of music is unique because it's borderless. It's without language. Pharrell, one of the greatest, you know, uh, producers, uh, writers, musicians today in the world, will use that power, and when you use music combined with a message, you can affect change. Because messages, that's how commercials work, and that's how major um, effecting of change on a global basis happens. So we're combining these two things. Uh, seven events, all of them in major stadiums. So we start in China, Sydney, Australia, Rio de Janeiro, Cape Town, South Africa, uh, New York City, um, in Paris, we're ending at the National Stadium. These events will run four to six hours, and they have major, major artists, some of the biggest artists ever collected, with one message, take climate action now. We're starting the campaign today. It get amplified in a major way um, on June 18th, and from June 18th to Paris, we are collecting voices, signatures, et cetera, in probably the largest campaign ever launched on the planet. Happily, uh, we've got some of the best people in the world working with us from you know, Al Gore, who made the announcement today, and um, is really the rock star, the spokesman on the climate, uh, Pharrell Williams, which has some amazing things that he's contextualizing and putting in this so that every voice on the planet is heard. Uh, my producing partner, uh, Aaron Grotsky, is joining me again, who's one of the great live producers today. And we've assembled a team of a coalition of the largest technology coalition in history, the largest NGO coalition that's ever come together, and we're working with the major networks, television networks of the world in 193 countries. We've cleared about 102 of them now, all broadcasting, all in the same day, this amplified message to kick this into Paris from June to uh, December. Live Earth, The Road to Paris, June 18th. Please join us and be one of the billion voices saying in harmony, in harmony. take climate action now. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're going off stage left. Good job, man. Thank you.